Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lancaster University Department of Education and webinar series. So um, today we have two of our PhD students in PhD in Education and Social Justice program. Um, so this seminar will be live streamed for off-campus postgraduate students, staff and other interested people who can uh, ask questions at the end of the presentation using their computer audio or via the chat box. Um, the session will also be recorded and the recording will be available on the department website. So if you wish not to be recorded, please get in touch with us. Um, so we'll make sure that um, your, your name or your photo is not included in the recording. Um, I will ask all attendees to switch off their camera and mute their microphone during the presentation. And now I will introduce you two of our speakers today. Um, both are our PhD students in Education and Social Justice program. We have Sofia um, Kapchia, uh, who is a specialist teacher of English with 20 years of teaching experience, and her background is in English language um, and literature, teaching at the secondary level and English curriculum and exam creation at both um, the primary and secondary levels. And um, Sophia is, is doing a thesis on intersectional pedagogies, and today she's going to present that. And we have a second speaker, Lee McKenzie, who works as a researcher and lecturer in English at the Universidad del Norte Barranquilla, uh, Colombia. Um, he's currently based in Colombia, and he is um, going to present his PhD thesis on development, international development in English in higher education in Colombia. Um, his research interests include language, human development, and language teacher education. So we have two presenters today. So each, um, each presenter will speak around 30 minutes. And after that, um, we'll have another 30 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, so I will now mute myself um, and stop my um, video. And the floor is Sophia's. Okay, welcome everyone. So thanks for that, Melis. Um, Melis has introduced me very well. So I'll just begin. So today I'm going to talk about intersectional pedagogy, its place in the English classroom. That is also going to be the topic of my thesis. I am from the Faculty of Education and Social Justice, and I've just put some contact details, my email and Twitter, if you wanted to contact me to discuss this further, that will be fine. So to begin, let's just um, put this in context and um, introduce uh, the background behind this. So as was previously said, I have 20 years experience as an English language specialist at the secondary level. I was born in Jamaica and, you know, I'm actually telling my story because I think it is important to place and to cement my thesis, where I'm coming from, why is this so important to me, intersectionality and intersectional practices, and why I think it should also be important it, as an important topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. So I have, as I said, my um, background is in secondary education and primarily I had different roles in terms of um, raising the Pupil, pupil premium PP and non um, PP, non pupil premium students, their attainment. And um, so, as a result, when I started to research this and I saw that in um, the research, the, the background um, linked, because it was saying, as Tran said, mm -hmm. that there was still an equity and a disparity there. Also since 2012, the gap between low income pupils attainment at the end of primary school and the end of secondary school has widened and this continues to widen. Um, previously, the research was really centered around black um, Caribbean boys and their under attainment. And then it went, it shifted, there was a shift to white working class boys. So we have so much research on boys and their attainment. And then, um, of course, there is that issue of the inequity that exists in not only in the classroom, but in the English classroom. There's still a big gap between 
race, class, and gender. So that was the background, so to speak. So my research is focused on intersectionality. And, you know, there has been a lot of buzz around this. Um, from Kimberly Crenshaw um, started to, um, from she coined the term and she started to do her research on this, it has been used in numerous ways. Um, for example, in social science, um, to decide the um, social categories such as gender, ethnicity, and class, or to examine differences and similarities within social categories, or to focus on multiple intersecting inequalities between social categories. So it is used in a numerous, numerous ways. Okay, so what is the objective of my study? My study focuses both on inequity and inequality. And I think this is important to um, look at that because it's not just um, the inequality that exists, there's also inequity. Um, it, examines, it examines how English teachers address inequalities in education and how teachers use their knowledge of intersectionality and um, the practices and how they look at gender, race and class and respond to that in order to raise students achievement and therefore cement their success in education. What gap and what, 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 when I went through, what did I see as a gap in the literature? So, there was, it was limited. I felt, I found initially that, oh, well, how am I going to get all the literature? It was limited in the sense that um, the, the research on the relationship between teachers, explicit, explicit understanding and practical knowledge of intersectionality, um, of race, of class, of gender, and also the impact of this on achievement and success of pupils in English um, lessons. Um, and then what knowledge do teachers have and how is this applied? That was also um, limited. So the availability of intersectional pedagogies in terms of the techniques and strategies for teaching and learning within the English classroom uh, was limited. So simply put, the question of what intersectional pedagogy would look like in the context of an English classroom was a really marked question when I went through. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to now just briefly um, go through um, the research problem, um, the rationale, which I, I think I have touched on um, the rationale for the study, um, the research design and the theoretical framework. Okay, so the research problem, as I said, I wanted to really zoom in on um, how teachers are using intersectional pedagogy within their classroom and if they were in fact using it and how much knowledge they have had of this and also how they could correctly apply intersectional practice, practices in order to raise their students' attainment. I... In order to do this, I, I, well, I adopted a theoretical approach in this thesis to distinguish that it's not satisfactory only to focus on race, gender, or social background inequalities. As an alternative, there must be a focus on the multiple identities that combine to produce what McCall calls complex inequality. So this um, study is positioned within an intersectional framework and it is important because it considers the combination of different attributes such as race, such as class, such as gender and examines how they interact and become separate disadvantaging factors which may intersect at different points to create different power relationships. So I think I just did that, that one. So 
intersectional intersectionality allows us to look at the constructs in society such as race, class, and gender intersectionally. I think that is important. Also to focus on the multiple identities that combine to contribute to these, what McCall refers to as complex inequality. It also examines how our multiple identities interact and become separate. And it also highlights the impact of race and racism on marginalized groups and the quest for social justice. And um, when I go through the, the um, some of the analysis of the findings, we look at that. So researchers um, talk a lot about um, these researchers about intersectional pedagogy, right? And they postulate that it's important for teachers to have an intersectionally aware teacher identity. And this concept of identity and how teachers take the, their identities within the classroom and how that impinges on students' learning, it's also something that the research um, underlines or even brings some light to. Um, Ferber and Herrera argue that the absence of intersectional pedagogies have the potential of doing more harm than good for pupils from marginalized backgrounds because they can further isolate and invalidate these pupils. And I have put that um, <clears throat> um, idea within today because when I went through my um, findings, one of the things that came through was that teachers um, had thought that the drawback, one drawback of, of using intersectional pedagogy was that they could be seen as stereotyping. And as a result, instead of um, embracing intersectional pedagogy, they um, were very tentative to use it. And when you look at this argument, this idea that the absence of this is not um, helping because it could create isolation, it could create um, a lot of maybe disenfranchised well, or disengagement with students. And then um, Berger believed that intersectional pedagogy encouraged pupils and their social literacy, which will allow people to increase their ability to recognize internalized oppression and the confines of singular views and the cost of dominance. And the English curriculum, within the English curriculum, we have a lot of scope to um, have discussions on oppression and these topics that are really big topics, such as racism and um, the visibility or lack of visibility of girls um, in terms of some girls in the research, it came out that some girls, they, within a classroom setting, they were there, but their voices, you know, they allow the boys to dominate. Um, and it could be that they had some internalized oppression. They felt that they um, or would be okay to just be quiet and not have their voices heard. So what was the methodology? Okay, so I had a focus group and I also had, so the focus group, I had um, two sessions lasting for an hour and I had um, four teachers in each session. And then we also had interviews. So the interview, so the sample size um, was 20 English teachers. The interviews were semi-structured interviews with closed and open um, questions. Right. Just sharing my research question, so you can see what I um, looked at. So I had two research questions. And so the first one was, to what extent does the intersectionality of class, race, and gender affect pupils' achievement and attitude to English? Then what factors influence attainment in English classes? 
How can teachers implement strategies to tackle the problem of differential attainment in English classes? And to what extent do teachers use intersectional pedagogy to challenge the structure of race, class and gender in their classes to ensure pupil um, attainment? So the research findings. So we're moving on to the nice bit where um, you can hear some of what came out. So what teachers say about intersectionality? So, and I have just put some direct quotes um, so you can get a feel of um, what was said. So they don't fit into one box and they, so this is a teacher referring to the students. They don't fit into one box because it's a whole overlap of different circumstances. So here you can see that yes, teachers are aware that pupils come in with multiplicity of identities, different circumstances. Another teacher said, but it's not that easy in terms of teaching and learning to in a way sort of like, you know, discriminate in that way and put everyone. So, you know, this is going to work for all, you know, black students. So the challenges within um, teaching and learning and really trying to get and increase people attainment, but not isolating and not, um, you know, including all students so that they're a part and not putting people as this um, teacher said in a box. Um, there's some of a mixture in terms of political, economic, social, and so in terms of race, gender, class, disability, and they all overlap. Then they, they, and then that becomes a child. And I like the way that, you know, we're looking at all these identities and how a child can come into the classroom, um, not just as an SEN child. And I was just recently talking to uh, a colleague about when you look on um, the website of schools, you see they have a clear SEN policy. Um, but there isn't any other um, policy in terms of inclusion. So in terms of inclusion, SEN is there and it's cemented. But in terms of um, the other policies to be inclusive, such as intersectional practices, because an Essian child will have other um, identities, other factors, you know, there'll be the gender, class, race, which all comes together and overlap. And the last one, there's um, not one way you can identify um, students, and that sums it up. What came out as well, was um, teachers believe that in order to be intersectional and order to cement intersectional practices within a teaching environment, within an English classroom, there must be cultural understanding of people's backgrounds. So teachers must have a cultural understanding of where their peoples are coming from. And have some empathy around that. So one um, teacher summed it up as, you know, when we go into a classroom as English teachers, right, we have obviously the knowledge of teaching English to students, but I think one of the things that teachers, English teachers, not just English teachers, all teachers lack, is an understanding of the people's background and, and, and understanding of specifically cultural backgrounds. So this, that was something that I saw um, recurring within um, the, the data and when I, when I started to look at the findings. So the importance of intersectional pedagogy to classroom practice was also discussed. And so the English curriculum that this question came up, does it allow an intersectional approach? So the English curriculum does it. And uh, one teacher put it like this. The teachers all spoke about um, the GCSE curriculum, English curriculum, not being fit for purpose. And they believed it wasn't fit for purpose because pupils don't care about Shakespeare. They don't care about poetry. They don't care about um, this 
And why they don't care about it is not because it is not important, but it's because there's no connection. So teachers aren't saying that poetry and Shakespeare and literacy and uh, the literature isn't important. What they were saying was there wasn't the connection, the link that tied in to what the students were going through each and every single day. So their own personal experience. So it created almost something of a disconnect and therefore perpetuated um, disengagement and unattainment. Another teacher said, obviously not, because there's no identity. It doesn't identify with so many sectors of the community. For the Black kids, we don't have any Black poets or Black writers in there for the Asian kids. There are so many fantastic writers and, you know, books and things like that. And um, teachers did say that because the key stage three curriculum had more scope, it allowed you to um, put in more like more authors of your choice, then it, so it was more favorable than the GCSE, um, the key stage four um, curriculum that was quite set and quite rigid. And so the next one. So we talk about why those things aren't in the GCSE curriculum. So this question, um, the teacher was um, saying how do, how do we ensure that we're trying to cater or marry up the two intersectionality or intersectional practices with what we do have the English curriculum? So um, talking about why those things aren't in the GCSE and they understand. So the students understand that and actually quite often they feel strongly about that. I mean, obviously with the more modern poetry, they have made an effort to make it more multicultural, but even then the students will understand that it's not available. And actually some of the poets themselves deal with this, this whole idea of not valuing, valuing different cultures and not valuing where people come from and prioritizing one thing over another and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, the scope to discuss what is happening and the situation. And then Another teacher said at GCSE, we look at Blood Brothers, that's a set text on the English curriculum. And obviously there's a massive, there, there's massive class lines that go through that. Sadly, with some of the other GCSE stuff, our hands are tied, aren't they? Because you know Shakespeare, yeah, you can't do anything with that. You know, the vast majority of the poetry is written by old white men. But actually to talk about that with the students and say, you know, actually the reason that there's not a lot of, of you know, early female poetry that we're seeing is because, you know, actually people don't necessarily think that was important to educate women to be able to produce their own literature and things like that. So, and I like what's coming out, that whole discussion, um, educating um, students about what is currently happening in society. Um, and these are big topics. Okay, so what teachers say about the benefits of intersectionality? And I'm going to skip through some of these because I want to get to um, the focus group. So I'll do one. Um, so the idea that we deliberately need, teachers need to deliberately embed these practices within their teaching. And it can't be um, by chance. And some of the teachers did say, that they don't deliberately um, use intersectional practices. Well, before being invited to take part in, this, in um, the, the um, research, they didn't try to that really consciously thought about, about it. So how do we, how to differentiate the curriculum? Because that's something, initially I was only going to do interviews, but then after talking to my supervisor, 
um, Melis, you know, it, it became important to do a focus group as well. I wanted for this um, research, for this study to be something that teachers could use. That they could say, okay, I can use this. I can take this away and make my practice better. So I spoke about the identity and I will touch on this because teachers talked about identity and their identity identity being so important to ensure that intersectionality is in their classroom. One teacher said, and I use um, Steve Jobs, he's, he said, so this is a quote from him, the storyteller is the most powerful person in the world. And in fact, if you think about that, I look at my students, how engaged they get when I start to talk about aspects of my life, where I was um, brought up, where I was born, um, coming from Jamaica, coming here, having a family, being a mom with five girls. They love that. They get really engaged and also, you know, saying, okay, if Miss can do this, then I can do as well. So teachers becoming models by sharing their story, not just um, expecting students to buy in. So one teacher um, summed it up nice, and she said that one way that I've tried to overcome that um, is bioeducation, number one, teaching them. And I think the fact that I'm from South Africa, I use that a lot in terms of helping, especially that particular topic of racism. I use the fact of my background, where I'm from and how I've addressed it, on how our countries addressed it in South Africa, try and get them to understand that I'm not saying that a magic, that's a magic formula for everything, but it's, a not, it's another thing that I do um, is to build relationships with the, with the students. So telling your story builds relationship. I'm moving on to the, um, to the intersectional practices that teachers in the study believed uh, would e effectively embed intersectionality in their classroom practice. So thinking about um, uh, key stage four, if you're planning your curriculum, what would you include in the scheme of work? And the teachers um, believe that these were things that must and should be there. So oracy topics and big topics such as race, class and gender, foreground those topics within your classroom discussions, get different opportunities um, to discuss these. So students are aware of different um, races, different practices, different um, customs. And also the students who um, are represent these races, these classes, these genders, will feel embraced and welcome because we're acknowledging um, them within our practice. They talked about using multimodal text. So you're using different texts. So you could use um, a written text. You could use a text, an audio text. You could use a video as well. So that would link to the different ways that um, students learn. Um, they talked about looking at societal role reversal and one video, the Bridgertons, would be something that you could use. And that's a video. And then one, another um, text, multimodal text that looks at this role reversal in society is Knots and Crosses um, by Mallory Black, Blackman. And a lot of schools do use um, Knots and Crosses for their year nine or year eight as well, using different images. And these images um, ensure that these images are reflective of the students in your classroom. You know, so you have girls, you have boys, you have different races as well. Using different genres as well. So having complaint letters, informal, formal language, having transactional writing, also linking that to real life skills and skills that they need in the future. 
they thought was really important. Talking about financial aspects of life as well and linking that. And as you see, the English classroom does embrace every other subject. I remember when I was training and my lecturer said that, and it is in fact true because in an English classroom, you can um, link a maths lesson, geography, um, science, you name it. And Sophia, you have three minutes left. So it three might... minutes. Okay, yeah. I'm coming down. Um, <laughs> okay, so they also talked about cultural capital and giving students the opportunity to go on enrichment um opportunities to maybe invite a local writer or a poet within um, the school and ensuring that it's different um, races, different genders as well. Also inviting local business people into school to raise aspirations among pupils. They also talk about having entrepreneurial skills as well and linking that to British values. They talked about career paths and looking at, you know, the British values, tolerance, responsibility, um, democracy, liberty, respect, law, and embedding that within the classroom. Community relationships was something that they thought was important. So you're connecting the different communities and relating that to the modern day um, experiences. They also thought that talking about ageism was something that was important as well. And the last bit is the terminology. So um, they believe that having different um, vocabulary, so some schools had tiered vocabulary. So you look at, and the tier one, two, and three looked at different um, levels, how sophisticated the vocabulary could get. And within that, you would have words such as discrimination, prejudice, oppression, etc. Okay, I know that we're going to have questions. My, my last slide. Thanks for listening. And of course, afterwards, I'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was a really a fascinating presentation. There's so much food for thought and it's, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions. It was, it was really amazing. I'm having a proud you know, supervisor moment now. So um, we're moving to Lee McKenzie um, and he'll present his thesis on higher education, Colombia, English and international development. So Lee, floor is yours. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, just please send me a message in the chat box if there are any problems with, with the sound, um, because obviously I don't know if you can hear me well or not. Um, I'm here in, in rural Colombia, um, so I'm, I'm on the side of a mountain. Um, so hopefully uh, I've done my best. I bought a generator to ensure that there are no more power cuts. Um, but um, I never know uh, here in Colombia. I'm always surprised. Um, okay, so can everybody see my screen? Hello? Yes, oh, we, can, we can see Lee, but um, would you like to press F5 so we can get the entire screen? Because now we can see your notes as well. <laughs> Um, sorry, it's. Uh, we can see your screen, but maybe you should go to the first one. We can see your notes as well. Right. Hang on. Hang on. Um, oh, we have time. Don't worry. OK, you shouldn't see my notes now. Yes, exactly. Now, yes, theorizing English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. OK. Um, so uh, this topic is broadly situated within a growing body of literature on the relationship between uh, English and development. And the purpose of the research uh, I conducted for my PhD thesis was to look at how English language education in Colombian higher education uh, contributes to or stifles human development. But I, I don't have time to talk about all of that. Um, so we're just going to look today at how English contributes to disadvantage in Colombia. And these are the specific things I will aim to do today.
Okay, um, I don't have much time, so I'm not going to read from slides to save time. I think you can read faster than I can speak. Um, so the, the question uh, driving this, this presentation um, is, is this one. Um, I'm interested in the interface between English and development in the, in the Global South. And as I work in Colombia, um, it made sense to explore this relationship in this context. Um, but it's also a very interesting uh, context because of the historic links uh, with the United States, um, which has uh, shifted perceptions of, of English in uh, Colombia. And as you can probably guess, uh, the capability approach helped me to frame this question. And I also use this framework uh, to help interpret the data. Uh, so why is such, such research needed? Um, there are several reasons. Um, a lot of the research into English and development in the Global South looks at the economic value of English um, rather than the value of English for individuals in, in their lives that go beyond that. Um, so I was interested in doing uh, studies uh, at the micro level. Um, Another reason to do such research is that um, for some reason, uh, education systems in the Global South, particularly in, in Latin America, there have been several um, national English language programs uh, in Chile. Um, British Council was involved in a big project in Uruguay, uh, Plan Cebal, which was um, according to the, the person who implemented it, who I spoke to, a disaster. Um, and there have been similar uh, projects in Ecuador uh, and Peru, and also in uh, Colombia. Um, it's also even on the university admissions exams in Brazil and Colombia, um, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, throughout Latin America, there has been a push to increase the levels of English proficiency um, and from looking at the documents, uh, policy documents from the different governments in different countries in Latin America, it again seems to be the economic value of English. Um, so it, it's said to contribute to, to development in the terms of in terms of employment or other economic uh, benefits. So English uh, in the region seems to have a, 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 a predominantly instrumental uh, value. And again, there's, there's not much research on this, looking at how it affects the lives of individuals. Um, oh, uh, just, just to mention one other point, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Common European Framework, but A1 is the lowest level, C2 is the highest level. And it's interesting that the Common European Framework, although it's European, uh, is widely used in uh, Latin America and university graduates in Ecuador and Colombia are expected to achieve a B1 level, which is about intermediate or let's say conversational level in English, a bit more than conversational level. Okay. Um, the research context specifically, uh, English in higher education in Colombia, uh, which is the context that I researched um, so, uh, how did English disadvantage or advantage um, higher education graduates in Colombia? Um, so, English is a, a, a ubiquitous in Colombian higher education, um, and it's included, as I, as I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, um, it's included on the university admissions and uh, exit exams. Um, and it's not just for universities, it's for other higher educational institutes. So if you want to be a, a plumber or an electrician, or um, if you want to be a dairy farmer, um, you have to learn English. Um, it's compulsory. You, you, you can't get out of it. And you often have to pay uh, to learn English in addition to the cost of your uh, studies. Um, and one impact of this is that some students have needed longer to complete their studies or they have failed to graduate uh, because of poor fluent fluency in English. 
at my university, you cannot get your graduation certificate, your degree, until you have passed all the English levels. Um, and this disproportionately impacts economically disadvantaged students since they typically have much lower English language proficiency uh, when entering higher education than their more privileged uh, counterparts. Uh, one reason for this uh, is that um, the students that have a lot of money, they go to private schools, which are um, not always, but typically um, of better quality uh, than the public schools, the state schools. Um, although some low end private schools maybe are quite similar to public schools with, with a few differences, like the student numbers might be lower, but the high end private schools um, typically teach uh, a bilingual program. So there are courses in English and courses in Spanish. So by the time that the students from wealthy backgrounds go to university, their English level uh, tends to be pretty good. And those who went to public schools uh, tend to have zero English or, or very limited uh, competence in English. Okay, so now you have some basic information about the uh, research context. Um, I'm just going to introduce the theoretical uh, framework. Um, and the three concepts from the capability approach, which I have time to, to briefly look at, are uh, capabilities. Um, so the advantage of capabilities is that um, it supports a multi-dimensional analysis of the relationship between English and advantage. So it goes beyond purely the economic dimension um, of the value of English and allows us to look at um, other dimensions um, of the value of English in uh, the Global South. And yes, it allows us to conceptualize development in terms of the, of the expansion of human freedoms. Um, and in the capability approach, the um, each person is treated as an end rather than as a means to some other end. Uh, the second concept, uh, which is useful um, for helping to understand uh, the data, um, is agency. And this allows us to view individuals not as passive recipients of the fruits of cunning development programs, but as active participants in their own uh, destiny. Uh, human agency is a critical uh, element of, of well-being. And it is important because it, it helps us to view participants not as victims of circumstance, um, but as individuals who can shape their uh, opportunities as um, agents, not uh, patients. Uh, and the third uh, concept I have time to look at is the concept of conversion factors. Um, these uh, shed light help us to shed light on the barriers that individuals face as a result of English language education in Colombian higher education. If we know what problems they're having with converting uh, their resources into functionings, um, then that's very useful information for policymakers, obviously, um, and can point to reasons why different individuals may struggle uh, to turn their English language skills to their advantage. So as I mentioned, students from private schools tend to have better English than students from public schools. Um, so the, the outcome or the functioning uh, when they get to university is, is different. Um, and it's interesting to look at the reasons for that. One reason is, is public schools, but obviously there are, there are more reasons. Okay, um, very few studies use the um, capabilities approach to look at the role of English in development. There's probably about 10 studies in total by about four or five different authors um, that have used the capability to, to approach to look at the role of English in development. So this is a very, very new um, field within the English and development field, a focus on the um, the value of English at the micro level is very new. There's quite a bit on language economics um, and how, as I said, uh, English has an economic value. And uh, 
maybe because of this, uh, English is untheorized, under theorized uh, within the capability uh, literature. So to help in this theorization, um, I draw on the writings of Nussbaum and Sen and others uh, within the capability approach to try to kind of theorize what, what is English within the capability approach? How can, how can English be understood within the capability approach? So I scoured the writings of uh, Nussbaum um, for her, um, her comments on English or languages. And this was probably the best quote that I found from her. So um, uh, from a cosmopolitan perspective, uh, learning languages is a very um, positive thing. Um, but she doesn't say anything here about English, but she certainly advocates uh, for teaching other languages than uh, the mother tongue of students. Um, in terms of uh, Sen's view of English or languages, well, he uh, often refers to India where English has a different role from the role of English in Colombia. And uh, in a very short YouTube video, he says that um, English helps economic integration as well as international relations in um, Colombia. He also says that language is central to human existence and our identity. So he sees that it has more than just an economic or, or instrumental uh, value. And uh, in his work with uh, Drez, don't know how to pronounce that, Dreze, um, he has written more extensively on uh, English. So I'll just give you a few seconds to read this quote. Um, so, so Sen and Andres, they, they clearly have no illusions about the um, negative role of English um, in in India. Um, and I think this is an important point. English expands opportunities for some and uh, limits opportunities for, for others. Um, elsewhere in the capability uh, research, um, some uh, scholars have only touched on the role that English can play in human flourishing and in education systems. Um, for example, um, particularly in Wilson Stridham, um, say insufficient levels of competence in the language of instruction can adversely affect university access and participation and can stifle development of Nussbaum's list of central capabilities. Um, interestingly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I've checked this, Nussbaum's um, central capabilities do not mention uh, language explicitly. I think they refer to literacy, um, which is different from speaking a language. So you can be illiterate, but still speak a foreign language. Um, uh, Adamson and Tamim, who, who have used the capability approach uh, to look at the role of English in the global south, uh, say that English acts as a social stratifier uh, because proficiency in this language strongly correlates with socioeconomic status. And as I've been saying, this is similar in Colombia. Uh, and one factor in this is private schooling, which tends to have more resources and better English language teachers uh, because they pay more. Uh, than the public sector. Um, okay, next slide. So finally, um, some other capability uh, scholars have written that uh, the lack, lack of English proficiency can represent a capability obstacle uh, to aspirations uh, achievement. So we saw on, on, on the previous slide how um, level of English or lack of competence in English can be an issue. Uh, and again, this is repeated here. 
Um, and interestingly, Callitz and Gorn Walker say that English speakers can face marginalization because of their accent or low level of English. And um, this is also true in Colombia. Um, when I teach my classes and my students have had a Colombian teacher, they often mock that Colombian teacher's English accent. Um, they seem to think that a native speaker is somehow better, which is obviously rubbish. Um, but there is that language ideology present in, in Colombian society. Um, and this last comment is quite interesting because it helps us to theorize uh, English uh, from a capability perspective. The internal capability of English cannot become a combined capability without interaction or practice. Um, there is some debate about whether an internal capability is actually a capability. Uh, Robbins says that it is not. Um, so if, if, if you prefer the term innate uh, capability, um, that that's also um, a way of conceptualizing it. Okay. Um, right, so the, the important point about this is that um, you need the right conditions to be able to develop the, the internal capability. Um, so uh, as we said, um, proficiency in English can um, be uh, a capability obstacle. And if you don't have the right conditions to develop that capability, um, then obviously that's going to not going to lead to capability expansion. Um, okay, so what are the implications of this theorization of uh, English as a linguistic uh, capability? Um, I would say that English can be understood as a relational capability. Um, the concept of relational refers to the interaction of social factors with individuals' capabilities. Uh, and language capabilities, I would argue, are relational because what counts as a sufficient level of competence for achieving important functionings depends on the context. So uh, when I lived in Switzerland, I was teaching primary school teachers so that they had a C2 level of English. Um, but a primary school teacher here in Colombia would probably only require uh, an A1 level of English. So the value of that English um, depends on the competence level that you have in that language, and that varies from context to context. Um, it's also relational because, uh, as I mentioned, teach, uh, speakers can face or teachers can face marginalization because of their English accent or level of proficiency. And if you are a non-native speaker, you may have experienced this. Um, I think there's also a lot of accentism within the UK. Um, I come from the North and I've lost a lot of my accent because I, I, I got the feeling that it wasn't received well uh, when I spoke with a thick Geordie accent like. So um, I, for these reasons, I would argue that uh, languages are relational. Um, the other reason that it can be relational is that this capability cannot, cannot normally be practiced in isolation. Um, if, if you lock somebody in a room for 15 years during their childhood, when they come out, they will not speak a language. So it requires interaction, going back to the point about internal capabilities and, and combined uh, capabilities. Okay. Um, another factor to consider is that linguistic capabilities differ in terms of robustness. Um, and this concurs with the Council of Europe, which developed the Common European Framework, uh, which uh, stated that the process of language learning is continuous and individual. No two users of a language, whether native speakers or foreign learners, have exactly the same competencies or develop them in the same way. So um, if you look at language acquisition theory, everybody has a unique interlanguage, a unique language. Um, not everybody has exactly the same vocabulary or, or English knowledge. Um, and everybody's um, language skills are in a state of development or um, the opposite if, if you don't have opportunities to speak uh, or practice English. So I think Komim calls 
um, certain types of capabilities becomings because they, they represent a process of something which is becoming something else and shouldn't be viewed as something static. Okay. Um, so I would argue that the linguistic capability is in various stages of development and varies from person to person. Um, I would also argue that just as an individual's level of education can promote different degrees of human flourishing, so too may her level of English. And since proficiency in English correlates positively with financial resources, viewing English as a process capability or as a becoming uh, may call attention to other injustices. So if we know that somebody's capability to speak English is low compared to somebody else's, um, that may indicate some injustices. So just to remind you of the uh, research question, which um, guides this uh, presentation, what barriers do economically vulnerable Colombians in higher education face uh, when developing the capability uh, to communicate in English? So I'm not going to look at how English promotes development, although that's part, that's the main focus of my thesis. I'm just going to look at the barriers that students faced. Um, and I specifically focused on, on, on uh, students from low income backgrounds and what problems they had learning English. Um, I interviewed 20 people um, from uh, disadvantaged, economic disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, and I've used pseudonyms, um, obviously ethical uh, procedures were uh, followed, uh, but I also had to translate uh, most of these interviews because the level of English that they had was so low that we couldn't do the interviews in English in all but four of the cases. Okay, so uh, broadly speaking, the, the interview data showed that almost all participants had very low levels of the capability to communicate in English when entering their respective higher education institutes. Many of these participants were placed in English classes alongside wealthier, uh, more proficient students. Um, all participants showed, uh, reported that the quality of English language education was low across uh, higher education uh, institutes, whether they were private or public. And few uh, participants obtained the expected B1 exit level of proficiency. So the target was not met in most cases. Um, so let's look at some extracts of uh, English and how this has uh, led to disadvantage or um, gave rise to disadvantage. Um, this is a quote from Thayer, uh, who was a public university degree graduate uh, in modern languages. I'll just give you a moment to read it. So this, this quote, um, I think, shows how linguistic disadvantage, uh, in this case, poor English proficiency, can uh, exacerbate the, the disadvantage experienced by students from lower socioeconomic strata when commencing post-compulsory education. Uh, in particular, the incipient nature of Theo's capability to communicate in English made it more difficult for him to participate in English language education on an equal footing uh, with his wealthier classmates. It also increased his workload and stress and constrained his capability for voice. As this quote also shows, wealthier students had more opportunities to interact in English as they had the economic means to pay for private tuition. Uh, the Colombo American Institute is a binational organization and the British Council is from the UK and they are, as you might expect, quite expensive. Um, and I would argue they are cashing in on English uh, fever in the global south. Um, okay, so this is another uh, quote. This is from uh, Katrina, 
who graduated from a private university with a degree in industrial engineering. Um, sadly, her experience of substandard English language education was the norm uh, rather than the exception. As I've said, graduates of all types of higher education institutes, be they private or public, uh, high end, low end, um, commented on the low quality of English language education they experienced during their higher education uh, careers. Um, as this quote shows, one consequence of low quality English language education is truancy. So this is another way in which English uh, leads to uh, disadvantage. It can demotivate students and make them not want to go to class. Um, related to truancy is also desertion. Um, so this quote from Samuel, um, who graduated from a public university with a degree in social sciences, um, shows that he just stopped attending his classes. Um, because he didn't have the time. As I said, in addition to studying their core subjects, they also have to take English, whether they want to or not. Um, and that obviously constrains their uh, capability of autonomy as well. Um, so uh, I would say that um, from the interview data, unrobust levels of the English language capability can constrain the capability for voice and inhibit uh, equitable participation. It can lead to desertion and truancy. It can negatively impact learners' grades and motivation, and it can result in increased levels of anxiety and stress. And if we had viewed English, the English language capability in binary either or terms, either you have it or you don't, I think this would obscure these injustices. It's only by looking at the different levels of the capability that individuals have that we can try to uncover the reasons for that and expose uh, injustices. And I would say that viewing the English language capability as relational and in a process of development is important since a low amount of this capability is more likely to lead to capability deprivation if other members of the linguistic environment are more proficient. So if everybody in the class speaks better English than you, um, it's obviously going to, to lead to, to disadvantage. And that is the same within society. Um, so thinking about the UK context, immigrants who don't speak a good level of English are likely to face a lot more disadvantage because of their poor English skills. In Colombia, it's also a problem in the education uh, system. Um, so viewing English as a process capability, which in the case of economically vulnerable students may be underdeveloped, compared to wealthier students begs the question as to why this is the case. And I've already given uh, some reasons for this. Um, and the data um, bears this out. So um, one factor is the differ differential instruction that poor and non-poor students receive prior to entering uh, higher education. Um, and all but three of the participants um, attended uh, public schools, and even those who attended private schools did not go to high-end private schools and did not uh, attend private schools for, their, for the entirety of their compulsory education. And the data showed that there are more opportunities to be exposed to and practice English in the private sector. There are more hours allocated to English. The, the pedagogy tends to be more communicative. So there, there is more group work and pair work and more opportunities uh, for learners to speak. Um, OK. Um, Lee, you have five minutes left um, just to wrap up the presentation. OK. Um, so uh, one quotation which highlights the poor quality uh, English language instruction that this study's economically disadvantaged students receive during their compulsory education is provided by uh, Jorgelis. Um, 
and graduated from a public university with a degree in economics. So I'll just give you a moment to read this. So as your Hellis explains uh, here, uh, private uh, bilingual schools are expensive and were therefore beyond the budget of most of the study studies uh, participants. Um, as I said previously, three participants attended private schools for some of their schooling, but they all had to transfer to public schools for economic reasons. Um, one of these participants is uh, Luna, and her experience is illuminating because it clearly highlights um, the contrast in standards between the public and the private sectors. So this is the quote from Luna. I'll just give you a moment to read this. So uh, Luna graduated from a private university with an MA in social development. And she shows here that one reason for the poor quality of English language education in public schools is teacher absenteeism. And this was corroborated by several other participants. So in public schools, one reason is the lack of uh, staff. Um, public schools, teachers sometimes don't even come to class. Uh, another reason is the amount of classroom time allocated to English. So according to the Colombian Ministry of Education, public school pupils should receive three hours a week of English, which is more than Luna was supposed to receive, even if her teachers had been present. Um, so I hope this highlights one key aspect of linguistic capabilities, which is the importance of practice and exposure. Um, but in public schools, the consensus was that opportunities for exposure and practice were very limited. And the findings that um, the standard of English instruction in public schools is low supports findings from elsewhere in the Global South, um, which show a negative relationship between uh, poverty and English uh, proficiency. Um, so I hope this shows that not only um, is the diffusion of English in Colombia implicated in injustices, um, it also highlights the importance of financial circumstances for developing the capability to communicate well in English. And this is highlighted by Mariluz, uh, who I've skipped, sorry. Uh, who um, told me the following. Yeah, so this term, uh, we have to settle for what's on offer. This is very, very common um, in, in Colombia that people have learned not to expect anything better. Um, so Mary Lucia seems to have internalized the logic that an education which is paid for directly um, is superior to an education which is funded indirectly through taxes. And it shows the extent to which quality education is seen as a privilege of the wealthy in Colombia. Uh, given that participants' access to better quality schools was limited for economic reasons, it's perhaps not surprising that this, this can lead individuals to adapt their preferences to unjust conditions. Um, so by restricting participants' educational choices to public schools of generally low quality, economic situation intersects with low quality English language education in both compulsory and higher education to constrain the development of the English uh, language capability. So in sum, the uh, interview data showed that individuals without the means to attend the better resourced private schools, which allow more opportunities for practice and exposure, are more likely to experience linguistic disadvantage when entering higher education. Um, in line with other studies, there appears to be a relationship between household income and the level of proficiency in English. Um, and despite, but despite this, all participants eventually passed their English classes and graduated. 
And just to leave on something positive, um, educational resilience was instrumental in enabling participants to catch up with their more pro proficient pe uh, peers. And I'll leave you with this quote from Theo, um, which demonstrates this, I think. So um, this quote shows how Theo had to negotiate barriers both inside and outside the classroom in order to claim the same amount of the capability to communicate in English at, as his wealthier peers. Um, however, Theo's dream uh, was to become proficient in English. Um, so he was able to use his resilience to associate with high performing students and a bicycle helped him to navigate the geographical obstacles he faced. Uh, so this, as this example indicates, conversion factors can interact to shape the English language proficiency, English language capability, sorry, uh, in complex and person specific ways. Um, so that's kind of it. Um, I would just like to share with you uh, one thing, if I may. Yes, of course. Uh, I'll just put it in the chat box. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, it's just an article that was was uh, published, um, and it goes into more depth on some of the issues that um, I have been uh, discussing today. So, if you're interested in any further reading on this, um, please go to the link in the chat box. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lee. That was a great presentation with rich insights from your participants. And I know that there is much more than that in your um, also thesis, which you weren't able to, of course, present in 30 minutes. But um, some of the discussions in your thesis were um, touching on linguistic imperialism. And there was a complex, there's a complex conceptualization of um, linguistic imperialism with linguistic capability. And then you have all those debates on massification of higher education coming in. And huge congratulations for your article. Um, I mean, so we, I'm sure many of our, um, you know, students and staff will be um, reading it and it's just like published only, only a week ago. So huge, huge, huge congrats. And that's the, you know, like um, one thing about our PhD students um, that um, they, they start um, publishing early on. So thank you very much, both of you. I'm having a really very proud supervisor moment here that, you know, like showing your, I mean, sharing your amazing work and um, with, with in a department seminar and, and listening to you is just like, it's really great. And um, I'm, I'm really so proud with both of you. So I'm just going to open the floor um, for discussions and, and questions. So since we're only 18 people, I would suggest that, you know, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and ask directly to Lee and Sophia. Um, so I will render down writing on the chat box. So anyone who has um, a question, maybe we can all, you know, if you want, of course, you can turn on your um, videos too. Exactly, exactly, Jen. I agree. That's just like a mind-blowing seminars and going on. Um, so, anyone who wants to who wants to keep the discussion with a question? If not, I will start with maybe one question to Sophia first. So, Sophia, um, thank you very much again for this this fantastic presentation. So, uh, my one of my questions is like, do you were talking about you know you were talking about intersectional intersectional pedagogies and so on, but I'm wondering to what extent actually teachers were using their intersectional pedagogies or how did they come to realize or the importance of intersectional pedagogies? Because this is not something necessarily embedded in teacher training. You no, know, the teacher training does not necessarily teach them about um, the importance of using this intersectionality. And, and you know, was did they talk about how did they come to realize and practice and, um, you know, learn about intersectional pedagogies? 
Okay, thanks for that question, Melis. I kind of touched on it when they said they didn't deliberately, um, they had like a wow moment. Oh, yes, this is what I do, sort of. And that thread went through the interviews like, okay, Sophia, before I didn't really know about this, but you've given me all this information beforehand. So before the interviews, I sent all the document with all the research questions, what it was about, and also the definitions of intersectional pedagogy and intersectionality. So they had that before the interviews. They also had the interview questions, and I think that helped them to prepare and really think about their practice in terms of those concepts. So when we had the interview, they did confess that, you know, um, I don't really conscious, I'm not doing this deliberately. I don't do it um, in the lesson, but I think this is how I try to be inclusive. So a lot of um, teachers, um, well, addressed it in terms of, how they use inclusion within their classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Kinmi, yes, yes, please. Um, I can ask a question to Lee. Um, so thanks for, I mean, both of your presentations were wonderful, but I mean, personally, <laughs> grown up in Korea, which has crazy English focus that I kind of can hear what's going on in Lee's presentation. So my question is, I mean, the comment, first of all, is that I think what English does to Korean students in higher education, it's exactly the same as you described in Colombia. And I think the concern is even more concerning because it really makes salient of the people's differences from their background. Before speaking English, actually, it's kind of they can hide where they're coming from if they want but as soon as they have to speak out English that's immediately people will hear their accent and level of English to proficiency, uh, proficiency that's really bad um, but my question is more like because you kind of employed the theoretical lens which is an agency and I noticed a lot of Korean students do a lot of things to kind of get over it or overcome it. So they've been creative in terms of learning English in their own way, which is very cheap, especially nowadays that have opportunity to do so. So I'm just wondering if any of the data that you or any observation that you have in terms of students actually use their own active agency to get over that this, uh, disadvantage they're coming from. Um, well, I Thanks for the question. Um, yes, uh, South Korea, th there's some interesting work being done in, in the South Korean context. There's a guy I think called Park, who talks about uh, neoliberalism and he, he just describes quite a frustrating uh, uh, state of affairs where everybody seems to be pushed to learn English and it's the standards keep getting higher and higher and higher. Um, so, I mean, I, I tried to give an example there of, of Theo, who he, he was one of the success stories from, from the 20 people that I interviewed. Um, I would say about a quarter had become fairly proficient in English. Um, four of the people in, that I interviewed agreed to do the interview in English. The other 16 didn't feel comfortable enough with their English um, so those, those four success stories are, are all interesting because what, what it showed was, and I've experienced this myself, the wealthy students, when they get to university, they stop trying they, because they, they, they think, oh, well, my English is so much better than everybody else's um, because their parents go to the States. And when they go to the States, they're the translator for their parents, you know, so they think that they have this, well, compared to the other people in the class, they do have a very good level of English. Um, so they stop coming to class, they stop trying, they do the bare minimum. And then the students that know that their English is poor, they are the ones that apply themselves and work. So it does kind of balance out. And, and um, Theos actually overtook most of his students in his class. So he started worse than them. But by the time he finished, his English was better. And he now works as a public school English teacher and has um, to, uh, worked in the States and in Brazil as a teacher. So there are, there are success stories, but I think 
four out of 16 is maybe not a success. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lee. So we have um, Thomas, Thomas Krupp. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, hello. Um, thank you. Hi. <laughs> thank you to both of uh, our presenters today. It's really, really interesting. Um, my question is actually for Lee because um, his his research and mine intersect quite a lot. I'm, I'm doing similar work in, in a different context. But um, yeah, Lee, I was wondering um, with the capabilities approach, um, did you also did you um, ask the participants in your interviews about um, Kind of English beyond the educational context, and 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 um, how what value they saw in learning English or or English having um, you know English communication skills and English proficiency. What was like? How did they value those competencies, and what impact did they have on did that have on their motivation? Sort of looking just beyond getting through the their university education. Because I imagine in Colombia, it's um, English likely plays a somewhat limited role in, in um, you know, in the public sphere or in, in, in society. So I was just wondering if that, if any of um, that came out in your studies or how, how that, how you engaged with that part of it. Okay, so uh, thanks for the question, uh, Thomas. Um, yeah, I wanted to go beyond just looking at the economic uh, value of English. So I, I looked at the research and, and uh, looked at all the ways that English is claimed to contribute to development. And we've had claims that English promotes peace, um, is useful for uh, getting foreign aid. Um, but I took, a, I took a critical perspective to this because, for example, the aid uh, question, uh, in Colombia, foreign aid equals foreign interference. Um, so I, I tried to kind of be very critical about whether English did contribute to other dimensions of uh, human flourishing beyond the economic. Um, what came out uh, quite strongly was aspirations that they, they felt English would be useful uh, to them in the future because they wanted to either go and study in an English speaking country or travel. But most of them, most of them hadn't done that. Yeah. So it was more aspirational than actual, actual having a real, value. Uh, some of them mentioned identity, that it, it was a, an important part of their identity. Um, access to knowledge was, was another dimension. Um, uh, being able to consume artistic and cultural products. So basically watching Netflix, um, but also, you know, uh, enjoying music. So, so there are a lot of dimensions that came out just beyond the, the economic I'm not sure if I answered all of your question. Please feel free to interrupt me. No, that's great. Thank you. No, that's what I was, I was wondering. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. So um, we have a question from Skyna. Uh, thank you, Melis. Uh, love both the presentations, both from Sophia and also from Lee. And I like the way different uh, frameworks were used to look at the study. So if I may, Melis, I'm going to ask questions to both of them. So for Sophia, you mentioned in your discussion that year nine were using notes and crosses. Uh, was there any opportunity where you could actually engage with the teachers and find how the teaching was very different when they were using a text from Shakespeare and a text from notes and crosses? So that's a question for Sophia. And a question for Lee. Uh, Lee, you mentioned that you had to drop your accent at some point. So how did that actually uh, come in terms of, did it affect your studies at all? So did you have to leave your accent in order to get on with the studies so that you can become an insider person? Or was it because you had your accent and you were seen as an outsider? Thank you. Okay, I'll go first. Thanks for that, Sakina. I hope I have pronounced your name correctly. Okay, um, so you ask how different it was when um, did 
how the difference that teachers found in teaching, for example, knots and crosses as opposed to Shakespeare. So what the teachers said when they spoke about um, texts such as knots and crosses, they felt that students um, engaged better with it because they felt as if it was um, more modern for one. And then he dealt with different races, um, which, you know, similar to their race, similar to their context. While Shakespeare, you know, a lot of students didn't even understand the language. And one teacher even said for some students who don't have like a Christian background, you know how some of the language in Shakespeare, like though and art, if you read the Bible, it's a similar kind of language. Um, so those students who um, were like Christians or read the Bible or that sort of thing, they um, related better, like they understood it better. They didn't have students saying, Miss, what, what is thou? What does that mean? And having to go through that kind of language. So yes, students were more engaged. And also it gen knots and crosses generated a lot of discussion because it turned the societal um, notion and, and what we thought on its head. You know, normally it's... Um, and most novels had like whites being in a dominant situation and in knots and crosses it's not like that so instantly students started to say what's happening here miss why and that created other discussions on race and also gender i hope that answered your question Yes, it, it did, Sophia. Thank you. I, mean, I enjoyed watching uh, Knots and Crosses. I really loved the costumes as well. So, because I was born in Kenya, so the costumes and the material that is used, in, uh, I sort of uh, wear those kinds of clothing as well. So, for me, it was like I can see something that's really happening live as well. So, thank you, Sophia. Uh, thank you, uh, Sukaina. I don't know, again, if that's the correct pronunciation. Um, my accent, well, I, I come from a, a very working class background and I was the first person in my family to go to university and I studied English at university, which is not the typical subject as somebody from a working class background would, would study, but I love books. Um, and I realised that, it, I don't know, I mean... I don't want to be presumptuous. I haven't read enough about this, but it it, it seems to be quite a middle class um, subject. It, at least that was my impression when when I did uh, my English degree, uh, and I found that I got a better response when I spoke more clearly and avoided using uh, slang or, or jordy terms. Um, so. And, and I, I found that in dealing with, for example, customer services, um, I, I tend to get a, a better response. But this, this could just be my own uh, low self-esteem. But um, And I think there's a lot of interesting research that could be done in that area, how accent effect affects your um, ep epistemic contribution or, or lack of. Um, so hopefully somebody will start researching that because I don't think I'm going to get around to it. <laughs> Uh, and thank you, Lee. Um, I think what you mentioned is quite a lot because uh, accents do make uh, an impact at times. And on on my side as well, I find that sometimes uh, if I don't really have a very high British accent, it can actually make an impact to the learners as well. So uh, thank you, uh, both Sophia and Lee. You did pronounce my name well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Skyne, and thank you, Lee. And I'm glad to see that, Lee, you are going into some of these epistemic justice, uh, you know, literature or, you know, like readings. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm glad that I, yeah, I'm, I'm getting into there. <laughs> so we have a question from Peter um, in the chat. Peter, would you like to unmute yourself and ask directly to Sophia? Okay, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, the question to Sophia really is, how do English teachers navigate the, the, the conflict between a drive towards non-discrimination in the classroom 
and the need to recognize the differences in the, in the, um, among students as they seek to um, learn English. And, it, and this is basically both ling English literature and English language. Okay, thanks for that question, Peter. So, um, one of the um, things that teachers say, they felt sometimes about that stereotypical, that they were being stereotyping, for example, you know, you don't want to be discriminatory to anyone. You want to be inclusive. However, some their ideas before the research, they came into it thinking, okay, if I'm going to use intersectional practices, I'm going to be saying, okay, this is what we're going to do for boys, this is what we're going to do for girls, this is what we're going to do for um, SEN, and that could create disadvantage. But then throughout the um, questioning and the discussions, what came out was including intersectional practices is, in fact, focusing on everyone, it's not creating um, inequality because yes, you do realize that, okay. So for example, let, let me give an example. If you're going to be teaching a topic around maybe sports, what you, in an intersectional classroom, you would have topics um, focused on all types. You wouldn't be um, rigid and set. You'd also have pictures of um, girls being footballers, boys being footballers. You'd be having Paralympics um, as well. So um, students with disabilities. So you're showing all the other, all the areas, all the ways to do it. And that opens it up more, makes it more inclusive rather than thinking, okay, I'm only going to um, do football for boys, you know, and that would, one teacher did say that um, her way of doing it was, you know, she gave an example of her growing up, going to school and having a career as the teacher saying, oh, you're black, so you can sing, you can do singing. And yes, yeah, she could sing. But she felt as if she was being put in a box just because of her race. So how do we open it up and ensure that it's more intersectional? That's the question. I hope I answered that. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sophia. So I think we're coming into an end, but I saw that Lorena, you raised your hand. Do you still want to ask your question before I finish? I sort of, yeah. Um, yeah, hello. hello. Um, yeah, it, it was just a comment more than a question. I'm from Ecuador and I can see that uh, um, the linguistic issues between uh, Colombia, in Colombia and in Ecuador are very similar. So um, maybe uh, Lee, you are uh, very appreciated there in, in Colombia because as you are a native speaker, um, you could see that um, it's like um, students appreciate more native speaker teachers than the all uh, the, for example, in my case here in Ecuador, students uh, always ask for uh, if they can have uh, uh, a, a native English, a, a, a native speaker in, in the English language. So uh, for that reason is that, uh, um, maybe uh, the Ecuadorian teachers um, feel like we are not uh, um, well appreciated in our country. However, we are um, um, doing the, um, we are preparing more and more in, the, um, in teaching English. And I would like to know maybe if uh, you have found um, a problem uh, with uh, the indigenous group in terms of um, equity or something like that when they uh, learn English with the other students. Uh, uh, muchas gracias por su pregunta, uh, Lorena. Thank you for the <laughs> question. Yes. Um, yes, I mean, they're, they're, they're quite comparable in some, I also worked in Ecuador, so I kind of know a bit about the context. Um, 
the in, I mean, as as you know, Ecuador has a larger indigenous uh, population than Colombia, from about the 50 million Colombians, only about one million identify as indigenous. But um, the English language requirement is not lifted in many cases, even though they speak an indigenous language and Spanish, and therefore meet the criteria for the what what is called Colombia's push to, to bilingualism. Um, they, in addition, have to learn English, which obviously disadvantages them because living in indigenous communities, how useful is English to them? Um, and the, the native speakerism, I'm just going to paste um, an article that I, I wrote about discriminatory advertisements. And it's amazing the amount of discrimination not just in the global south, and I, I think it's, it would be a mistake to, to categorize it as a problem that's just in the global south. I've seen native speakerism in Europe um, and in, in Asia, um, basically saying native speakers only. If you don't have a British passport or American passport, don't apply, which is just crazy that, you know, we, we, the UN condemned discrimination in, I think, 1952, and 70 years later, we are still discriminating against people on the basis of origin with the argument that um, native speakers are somehow better. Um, but th this is the discourse of linguistic imperialism, which, which I cover in my uh, thesis, um, which is very pervasive. Um, so if you're interested in this, uh, have a look at uh, Robert Philipson. He has five fallacies of the of English and one of them is the native speaker fallacy that the native speaker is somehow better um, so I think it requires more people like yourself to challenge this uh, this dominant narrative yeah thank you thank you so much Lee um, so I'll let the session here now we're just slightly 10 minutes over the scheduled time um, but I would like to say huge 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 Thanks and congratulations to Sophia and me for this fantastic session. And Lee, again, congratulations for your on your article, new article. I will just like share now on um, on our social media accounts um, your article so that you know everyone gets to read that. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much, everyone. This was the last session of our webinar series, and um, we will be seeing you um, next academic year, which will start in October. So until then, please take care. Have a lovely summer or winter break, wherever you are. And yeah, and see you in October. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I already post the session, but you know, it's a quick one, so. Um, so the question is, what role does culture play in the learning of English in higher education? And do you think that social media could em impact English proficiencies? Um, yes, I think social media it can impact. And, and I, I think uh, that's something that needs to be explored more um, because, uh, yeah, I haven't looked into it a lot, to be honest with you, but I think social media can have a big impact. Culture... Well, I mean, I think it depends on which paradigm you're working within. Um, a, a, a lot of uh, typical teacher training for English teachers um, says that you should bring that cultural aspect in. But um, I, if English is the global language, why does it have to be tied to a particular place? That sounds a bit like the um, that German ideology that, you know, the blood and land thing that somehow language is tied to a certain place. Um, and I, I don't think that's the case with English and it shouldn't be. English um, has many uses and, and the majority of people who speak English speak it as a second language rather than a first language. So why should um, our, and that's the wrong word to use, but why should the English of people like myself be the dominant form. Yeah. Think, say thank you and congratulations on your presentation, Peter. Oh, okay. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, very much, both of you. And I know that I'll be in touch with both of you individually. You just leave right before your um, Viva. And we'll just like have a mock Viva and discuss through. <laughs> I hope you're looking forward to that. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Malice, and that congratulations on you to produce two wonderful <laughs> PhD students. <laughs> Make them speak today. Exactly. And this was a really well attended session too. You know, I mean, it's yeah. always it's always amazing how our PhD students' presentations are always well attended. You know. Mm -hmm. So I'll yeah. well done all. Okay. Have a lovely okay. evening and so on. bye for now. Thank you. Thank you and bye.